Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here speaking from the Polar Vortex, the second day of the Polar Vortex here in Chicago. Man, it was crazy cold. And thankfully, I didn't have to go anywhere. As I, you know, I'm uh, still recovering from uh, my recent illness. And uh, everything is going great. Thank you very much for the words of encouragement that I've gotten through emails and uh, messages on uh, social media. Thank you, truly. It means a lot. Today we've got uh, two episodes for you, so uh, if you're only catching this one, make sure you look at the feed and uh, check out the other interview, which is with uh, Dennis Kitchen, talking about the history of underground comics, his association with Will Eisner. Uh, fascinating conversation. Underground comics, really, you know, just like how did they how did they make them? And, and uh, really a lot of um, ties to creator-owned comics today in terms of the way that Dennis and a lot of the underground comic people operated. So a really interesting conversation. But this one that you're listening to right now, this is with Jason Sachs. Now, Jason has written the uh, history of the 90s in comics for Tomorrow's and their Comic Book Chronicles, an excellent series of books that uh, feature a look at each comic book decade from the 40s to the present. And uh, the 90s is one of the recent volumes. It is great. It's uh, a wonderful, very detailed look at every big company and small company, boom and bust. We all know the roller coaster ride that the 90s was for comic books, the speculation market, uh, a lot of great comics. Sometimes the 90s get maligned for uh, the product. And really, uh, especially if you read Jason's book, you're going to realize how many great comics actually did come out in the 90s. And again, every decade, for if you're an adolescent, that's your favorite decade. I know Kirkman, of course, big 90s fan. Oh, that was his decade, man. That's when he was a teenager and, and loving comic books. So I get it. And uh, it was really fun talking to Jason about uh, the book. It is incredibly detailed. They talk about the changes in the direct market, the moves that Marvel made to uh, have its own distributorship and how it killed a couple uh, distributors like Capital City and others and uh, kind of uh, helped uh, form where we are today in the direct market with Diamond as uh, the, the lone uh, survivor of the 90s. So a very interesting roller coaster ride from boom to bust of the 90s with Jason Sachs on today's Word Balloon. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your support. Uh, man, a lot of people have really uh, come through and uh, I've got new subscribers and also people have uh, upped their donations while I am uh, convalescing. Uh, still out of uh, radio work right now. They haven't cleared me yet to go back to radio work. So uh, it helps a lot, League. I appreciate the support. Thank you very much. If you'd like to subscribe to Word Balloon, you can go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon or the front page and click on the Patreon ad at wordballoon.com. But truly, thank you for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics, the industry's fastest growing independent publishing company, promoting new and established comic audience to read dangerously. They're claiming 2019 as the year of reading dangerously. As a publisher of many of the most talked about independent titles of the past few years, including books like Animosity, A Walk Through Hell, Dark Ark, and Baby Teeth, Aftershock will push the envelope even further this year with new releases and ongoing series that continue to thrill, chill, and challenge both imaginations and sensibilities. They're working with top writers and artists and some of the brightest new stars in the creative community. Some of the new 2019 titles debuting soon will be Stronghold with Phil Hester and Ryan Kelly, Oberon, a new supernatural series by Ryan Parrott, Dark Red from Tim Seeley, that centers on a vampire living in rural America. Plus, Out of the Blue and Horror, just to name a few. They will cut across all genres and take readers far beyond their comfort zones. Now, in the weeks ahead, we'll be talking to some of these creators about their books, but you don't have to wait. Go to the website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order through your local shop at AfterShotComics.com. All right, let's get into our conversation now. The history of uh, comics in the 90s with uh, Jason Stack. Now, on Word Balloon. Jason Sachs, welcome to Word Balloon, and congratulations on uh, this fine book, another edition of the American Comic Book Chronicles. I've been uh, paying attention, and uh, you're tackling a very fun decade, the 90s. Thank you, John. Yeah, it's been it, it's a very fun decade to write about. There's just so much that happened during that time frame. I mean, we all know about the hollow foil covers and the <laughs> amazing early image ripoffs and Rob Liefeld's unbelievable artwork. But it's also a great decade if you're interested in the rise and fall of the comic book industry in terms of uh, sales, 
We've certainly never seen sales at anywhere close to the numbers that we saw in the early 90s. And then the amazing fall of the industry in the second and a half of the decade some of the greatest comic art came out during that time and some of the worst it's just it was a treat to write about it <laughs> it's true man and you're right uh um i'll be honest i checked out about halfway through the decade <laughs> and didn't come back until 99 because you know and uh, this will be my personal moment but yeah you know the art kind of dominated the story mm-hmm. and and it just it uh, like i felt like the stories were getting dumber and so mm-hmm. really like I remember, like, certainly I bought Marvels, and I certainly bought Kingdom Come, and I think it was Kingdom Come, like, 95 or 96? 95, yeah. Oh, 95. Okay, good. Then, yeah, then I, like, spent about four years not paying attention and then hearing that, hey, uh, Daredevil's good again, and Kevin Smith's writing it. And I'm like, oh, well, I know he's a comic book fan. Maybe, you know, maybe it's all right. So I picked up his Daredevil, and then that's when I discovered Rucka and Brubaker and Bendis. In 1999, mm-hmm. and I'm like, all oh, the arts or the writing's good again, okay, <laughs> you know. And I and I was more of a I was more of a, and I, yeah, I want to hear what you think, but I was more of a DC guy than a Marvel guy, so mm-hmm. I really did miss. It's funny, I, I would go through quarter bins and sometimes be like, oh, there's an interesting little Shang Chi mini series from like 1998. Let me check it out, and then I'd read it and be like. Oh, never mind. <laughs> so <laughs> this isn't as good as I remember it being. Yeah. So, yeah. T- so tell me about like again. We're gonna go, we're gonna get into detail, but yeah, I don't know. Like, were you consistent throughout the the decade for yourself as a fan? Um, no, I went in and out myself too. Uh, I had little kids during that decade, so money was a little tired than it could have been. Sure. But going back now as an adult and rereading this stuff, it's pretty amazing. I mean. Yeah, I love a lot of the stuff that came out in the late 90s and a lot of the stuff that came out in the late 90s really set the template for how we think of superhero comics today. You know, stuff like The Authority or uh, Kurt Busiek's uh, Avengers and Iron Man really set the pace for the movies that started coming out in the early 2000s. That's a good point. Um, yeah. But the earliest stuff, you know, the crazy Rob Liefeld, Jim Lee, uh, Todd McFarlane books are just Fun, uninhibited, uninhibited, wacky fun. People just throwing crap at the wall and seeing what people love. And I think that's what people responded to at the time. I mean, no one will accuse Ralph Blyfeld of being the greatest comic book artist, but we will accuse him of being like the guy. Say it again, He's because smiling actually, and, you, you dropped out for a second. So, you, you, oh, you know, we got the first half of that. Do it again. He, yeah, no one will accuse Rob Liefeld of being the greatest comic artist, but in terms of being the happiest or the one who has the most fun doing his work, absolutely. And you can see it in every page he drew. Absolutely. And, and a lot of energy. And I think really yeah. channeled his enthusiasm into good action and a lot of energy on those pages. I agree with that. Um, the I'll be honest, other than Spawn, the, the a lot of the image creations just didn't speak to me. And I was. I was just kind of an older, I guess, reader that was just – uh, really satisfied with DC and Marvel. And truly, I did miss Authority the first time around. I did miss mm-hmm. Preacher the first time around. And a lot of the really exceptional stuff that came from Vertigo and, you know, uh, those other those other places and stuff. And um, like I said, yeah, it re- really for me, like, the wake-up call was 99. And a big thing, and I, and I know you cover it as well, is No Man's Land. Um you know that was a that was a nice little resurgence for Batman, and I think actually first I saw the novelization that Rucker wrote, and then mm-hmm. I went to the comic stores and I'm like, oh look at this, it's still going. You know, it I, it's, it was a comic story, and it, it looks like a really good comic book story. So, yeah, it is a great story. It starts with Cataclysm in 1998 yes. when the earthquake hits Gotham City, and a lot of those stories around the earthquake are very are just great, solid human interest stories. You know, it's. It's uh, Robin or someone having to save people who are stuck in that basement and the walls are collapsing in on him and he just does everything he can to save them. And those are great stories. And then once we get into No Man's Land, which is just this great high concept idea of what happens if he cut off Gotham City and becomes this no man's land where the criminals run the society. It's just such a cool, clever, interesting idea. And it just is such a grabber. A Um, a lot of personal moments like – when Batman is finally re- willing to reveal himself to, to Jim Gordon. And mm-hmm. he's like, don't you dare. How dare you insult me? You know, and it's like, that's his attitude. It's like, wow, what the hell's going on, man? <laughs> Luther's going to come in and buy up all the assets to Gotham. And it really, it had some amazing twists. I'm a, I'm a huge No Man's fan, No Man's Land fan. And that, like I said, it made me a Rucka fan. And, um, yeah. 
And again, uh, well, uh, you know, that's the end of the story. That's the end of the 90s. You cover every year it, it, as much as these comic book chronicle books have. And did you work on a previous volume as well? I wrote the 1970s volume and I wrote portions of the 1990, or 1980s volume. Oh, very cool. So, yeah, I've covered uh, three different decades of it. Okay, um, that's awesome. Yeah, and, you know, I've, I read the 60s one. I was really interested in uh, certainly the decade before I really started paying attention. And, uh-huh. I, and and believe me, they are on my wish list. I mean, uh, it was nice. They they sent me a review copy for the 90s. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm going to have to, you know, go to tomorrow's website and uh, pick up the other uh, – other volumes I haven't read yet because they are they're incredibly extensive. It it not only covers uh, the decade from a critical standpoint, but you get into the inside baseball of the market and the numbers and right. how, how each publisher was doing uh, and and how successful some of these ideas were. Whether they were critical favorites or not, you also have sales numbers to back your your stories up as well to say yes. As fun as that was, it wasn't a big hit, and you know some some great runs that were cut off short because of low sales. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that was the most fun part about doing this work is just picking up the old fanzines and magazines from that era. So I read every issue of wizard magazine from the 1990s, comics journal heroes illustrated the old amazing heroes, but also like comics retailer magazine. And that was just an amazing revelation. For example, um, we're used now to thinking of Marvels as one of the greatest uh, stories ever published. Yeah, uh, you know Kurt Busiek and and, uh, and Alex Ross delivered this work that really is a masterpiece now. But at the time, people were shocked by the by the uh, quality of the sales on it. First of all, it's a five ninety five book at a time that most books were a dollar ninety nine. So and no one had heard of uh, people had heard of Busiek. He was a kind of a journeyman writer. No one had heard of Alex Ross. That's right. And the book just hit, and it was this. Boom! And there's all these kind of ecstatic comments from people, uh, from the retailers in the in '93, I believe, when the book came out. Like, we never expected to sell like this, but this is exactly what our fans want. Um, and now, looking back on it, it's kind of like a signal event that shows like where comics were going to go in the late '90s, also because it's about embracing what makes superheroes really interesting and important. Um, so it was cool to get this kind of coming out of nowhere surprise as well as just kind of see how it the influence of it played out through the entire decade so I, i'm not sure you could get to something like the authority without having marvels first Makes or a lot of Kurt sense. six avengers without having marvels first yes yes absolutely the one that he did with uh wasn't it was it perez or uh, yeah george perez yeah avengers forever uh, that was with Carlos Pacheco. That's a 12 issue miniseries, oh. which is fantastic. That's so but what, fun. Oh, but you're just saying his, his regular Avengers run with yeah, he, Heroes Return, the, uh, the Avengers. He also of did course. a great run yes, on yes. Iron Man at that time, too, which is so fun. Um, I'm not sure it's ever been reprinted, but it's, Jam- it's Tony Stark as James Bond traveling the world and having amazing superhero adventures. It's just so fun. Well, that's where I'm going to have to use my Marvel Unlimited account and you know go back and, and read that <laughs> stuff. No, you know, and I, you know, I got I always want to point out because again, I'm no I I had no crystal ball, but out of out of nowhere, my day job back in the early 90s was working at a bank and it was the bank that Now Comics used for their accounts. And I literally was in the the, the department where we would see uh all the checks that came in you know, to to uh, to now comics, and it was all this stuff for Terminator, the Burning Earth, Terminator, the mm-hmm. Burning Earth, and I'm like, what is this? And then I mm-hmm. looked at it up, and it's that was one of Alex's first big books, and um, you know, pre Marvels and everything, and I'm like, oh, and then when I heard about Marvels, it's like that's that Terminator artist. Okay, cool. And again, the I mean, even the previews that Marvel put out of Marvels and everything looks so amazing. So now I wanted, I actually I wanted to talk to you about because you mentioned all the. Uh, comic magazines of the time, and it would be great to go back and read comic re- retailer as as those years were happening. But Wizard in particular, because mm-hmm. that was such a game changer in a lot of ways. And one of them that I find fascinating, and I got to be honest, I'm a little cynical about, was as you point out, it challenged Overstreet in terms of offering a price guide for for books. And it, I really think they were as as. And I want to know what you think of this. I, I, I mean, there were a lot of contributing factors to the speculation market where comic books were treated like baseball cards and bought like investments. And everyone thought the number ones they were buying were going to, you know, put their kids through college or, you know, set up their retirement <laughs> accounts and all that stuff. But yeah. I really yep. felt that Wizard was kind of ginning the numbers. And, and, you know, and certainly with their own, like they had that Black Bull imprint 
And mm-hmm. I don't know if that started in the 90s, but I know that it was in the early 2000s as well. 2000, yeah. Oh, okay, it started in 2000. Just outside, just outside the window of our book, yeah. Okay, but yeah, man, I'm like, you know, I'm like, hey, man, these guys are kind of, you know, we, you know, our Black Bull book, our first issue is worth fifty dollars, and it's like, yeah, yeah, to who? You know, uh-huh. and I know people, I because I have friends who own stores, as I'm sure you do, and they'd walk in with Wizard and be like, "Yeah, but it says here Invaders Four is seven hundred dollars," and it's like, "Yeah, I'm not paying seven hundred dollars for your Invaders Four. Get out of here." Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, Wizard started uh, 1991. Actually, killed. Uh, it had the it had the price guide in it, and the important thing it was on newsstands too, so people could just ordinary people sure. kids at that time would pick it up because of the spider-man covers or whatever and see if their comics worth a lot of money and also was re- this really smart way of channeling people to the what they called the hot artists and writers at the time yes yes um it really just just drove the hype um there's a really interesting example of what wizard did actually that this kind of this kind of codependent launch so wizard number seven which was um early 92 had a cover feature on Valiant Comics. And Valiant had uh, started in 1990, basically was just struggling along. Um, but they came out with this sort of wizard that just hyped uh, the Valiant books like crazy just as the Unity crossover was coming out. And for whatever reason, it really captured people's imagination. And the numbers on Unity went from relatively small numbers to massively large numbers to the point where, like, by mid two thousand or bit mid nineteen ninety two, early nineteen ninety three, their numbers had exploded to ten times what they were before. Wow. And they believe it's the Wizard effect tied to the rise of uh, Image Comics. Uh, got people reading Wizard, got people reading Valiant, got people reading the Image books, and it all became this kind of symbiotic relationship that just grew and grew and grew. Um, and it leads to this kind of interesting thing where by 1993, there was this amazing thirst for new comics universes so that stuff like X-Men had, a, had gimmicks every month basically to get by because people, what people wanted to buy was Youngblood and Exo Man and Warren Turok. Yep. And so there's this feeling for a short time like the entire industry was just flipping. There's a transformation happening um, that didn't last for a a long time, but was really tangible, and in large part, kind of brought in the brought about by Wizard. Yeah, and it, it's um, like this kind of, like you said, codependent sort of relationship with the publishers. And I know that uh, you point out too that they would come out with those half issues, which was a big deal, and everything as well. Uh huh. Yeah, I collected those back in the day too. Sure, sure. You yeah, know. and everyone everyone loved and hated the price guide. I mean, yeah, I have friends who ran stores at the time too. <laughs> were like, yes, uh, you know, Spawn Number One was like the number one selling book for most of the 1990s, Makes and sense. they were listing Spawn One as like a twenty five dollar book for a while. But that book sold like nine hundred and thirty thousand copies to at wholesale. So it's literally like a dollar book. I mean, obviously, we still see it now occasionally in the quarter bin. Oh yeah, I have I have um, a friend who's in but, the but like I have a friend who's in the memorabilia business. And he's he's not that hip to comics, and he's like, oh, this guy wants to like I can get like half a warehouse full of like '90s comics. Should I do it? <laughs> I'm like, no, yeah. no. I'm like, unless you want to wallpaper your your house with you know old comic pages. I said, no, absolutely yeah. not, man. They're not worth it. Don't. Do, I'm like, they're not even worth a cent. No, don't do it. <laughs> Turok Dinosaur Hunter number one with this amazing hollow foil cover it actually one of the coolest covers of the 90s <laughs> sold 1.75 million copies at to comic stores and there's a belief that not even 200,000 copies were actually bought by readers i hear you man this is what i'm i know that i mean x-men won the jim lee uh book you know eight, eight million? sold eight million eight point one million insane eight point one million and there's retailers now who were around back in the day who still have long boxes full of x-men ones yeah and i mean that's all part of this kind of amazing boom that happened in, in the early <laughs> 90s where just all this money rushed in and everyone believed this stuff was gonna suddenly pay for their kids college educations um and just as quickly that it entirely evaporated but for this very short window of time like comics were where it was it was the place to be in 1993 there were 28 different new companies or new imprints created uh, to sell comics wow. um you know marvel marvel had a couple lines uh one based on Clive Barker comics, DC launched Vertigo that year, Milestone Comics came out, yes. Ultraverse came out, Comics yes. Greatest World, all the way down to like Rip Off Press public, created a kid's imprint called Magnacom Comics. No one remembers they published Cutie Bunny comics. Like everyone was in this gold rush. 
Tops. And then yeah, I love that you're tops, like you know, yeah. Tops Tops was and yeah, I, I want you to finish your thought. But yeah, Tops went from as you said, as they were putting trading cards in comics, it was in you know, inevitable that Tops would be like, All right, let's get in the comic book business. And, you know, they made good comics for a while. There were there were some good comics there for a while, absolutely. And um yeah, and of course the, then we got the whole thing of like comics being sold in bags with cards attached to them and everything. Yes. Because after all, it's gonna make it so much more valuable. If you never take it out of the bag, it's even better. <laughs> Like, wait, wait, wait. Like, does it not matter how how good? The- no, it's just like cool speculation. This is going to pay for my kids. This is going to pay for my mortgage. Well, good luck with that. Well, and, good and, luck with that. And, and truly, again, that's one of the reasons why I checked out because it w- Yeah, they were collectibles. And it's like uh, the, the word is comic book or the words, the compound word is comic book. And it's like. I want to be able to read this. I don't, I don't tell me I can't open the bag because I'm going right. to value it. And then when you did and you read it, it's like, well, that's certainly worth, <laughs> <what's> <laughs> worth buying. What the hell? And again, that's why I checked out. But yeah. um, but and also you really no, get you, into the whole. No, please finish your thought, please. You did miss out on a lot of good stuff, though. I, mean, I did. You're right. <laughs> um, throughout, throughout the entire decade, I mean, I mentioned Valiant Comics earlier. Um, the early Valiant books are really good, what they call the pre-unity Valiant books yep. um rye exo man of war harbinger those are fantastic the, the books written by jim shooter were just so interesting on, on a and few different levels great and artists kind of the, too. great know, artists too david laffam and others yes, yes. barry winter yeah, smith david, david laffam an excellent creator absolutely um and uh so there, i mean there's great stuff scattered throughout the decade but um yeah it's all uh you just got to take some of the bad with the good i guess well and it's and honestly you could say that about every decade i mean mm-hmm. that's the thing so the nineties get well, and again, the nineties earned the 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 knock because of some. It got too gimmicky, and the gimmicks got in the way of the good books that were out there. But mm-hmm. also, um, the distribution wars are, and I, and I'm glad yeah. to chronicle all that because that that was a major change in the business as well. Yeah, that was a crushing experience for the entire industry. So yeah, I mean, uh, all of a sudden, basically, Marvel decided. Well, I guess basically as part of Marvel's attempt to kind of tr- control the entire uh, comics world, they decided to distribute their comics through a, a, their own distributor instead of using uh, multiple distributors. So before 1994 or so, there were up to a dozen different distributors in the, com- in the country who would sell comics basically in regional uh, areas. Mm-hmm. And Diamond was Diamond and Capital City were the only two that sold nationally. In 1994, Marvel decided they were going to uh, buy a stake in a company called – uh, Heroes World and Heroes World was just a small East Coast, uh, mostly New York and Connecticut distributor, um, and so all their Marvel comics just through them. So they would cut off all the other distributors, and that caused everyone else to move to uh, other distributors. So uh, a handful of companies went to Capital City, but almost everyone went to Diamond. All of a sudden, the companies were fighting out who was going to be selling their books, and uh, caused the industry to collapse even more. First of all, uh, Heroes World had trouble fulfilling orders. And we have a a great quote in the book, which unfortunately I don't have right at my fingertips. But basically, a retailer said, we we never got anything. For for months, we never got anything from Marvel. So we just stopped selling Marvels. We started selling only DCs. And the industry, the readers realized they didn't care about the Marvel books as much. Um, Wow. And then then finally, everyone kind of coalesced around – uh, Diamond Comics, and that ended up taking off. Yeah, and we're at, and obviously it's you know a one a one distributor world today. Although I know there are some minor ones for certain art, uh, more boutique publishers. I know that I was talking to Art Baltazar before uh, calling you, and he told me that yeah, again in this uh, pre Diamond exclusive world, he had ten distributors when he was cranking mm-hmm. out indie comics when he was really young and, and just starting in the business and would, you know, do a, a 3,000 print run of a book and, you know, it, they sold immediately because there were so many distributors when he first broke in and that dried up obviously very quickly when, you know, everything kind of collapsed. Um, it's yeah. yeah, go the, on, yeah. The industry lost about 25% of its market share just in the year or so while the distribution wars were going on. They were selling about 20 million copies per month and it dropped to 16 million copies a month by the time that wow. was all over with. Wow. And then within another year, it dropped another uh, 4 million copies. I mean, it, just just the sales numbers alone throughout the industry throughout the decade are incredible. At its peak in, in uh, July 1993, there were 48 million copies sold per month. There per was month? 
for well, it, yeah. So there was one month in particular where um, there was a thirty million dollar day in November nineteen ninety two when Superman seventy five came out. Sure, yeah. It lifted everything up in in uh, dead. Uh, what's its name? The, the the image book, or not the the Valiant book, uh, not Bloodshot sold seven hundred fifty thousand copies that day. Wow. By the end of the decade, so at the peak, we were we, were, we sold forty eight point two million copies. Uh, by the end of the decade, seven million copies were sold. Jesus, yeah, man, it's just it's just unbelievable. Well, I know. I mean, I, I've I've talked to creators that lived through the boom and bust, and yeah, went through you know amazing royalty checks in the early nineties to, uh, you know, got a uh, got Mike Oming is a classic example of that who was getting a lot of work as an inker in the early part mm-hmm. of the nineties. And then everything dried up and he, you know, had to take a day job and he was working in like the equivalent of like a toll booth. But it was in this like crazy, like parking lot sort of. Yeah, like trucking kind of parking lot that he just had to be there for, you know, the trucks to like come in, turn in their manifest, get the new manifest and stuff. And, yeah, he was just sketching. And that's when he changed his style to a more cartoony style. And he was friends with Bendis and Omi or Bendis and Mac at that point. And that's when they kind of came up with the idea for powers uh, oh, that's in, so cool. like, during the bust. And, you know, finally in 99, they, they put it out. But, yeah, no, Mike, Mike is a classic, you know, comic warrior that saw the early boom and then really kind of suffered for a couple of years and had to kind of reinvent himself. And thankfully, you know, the market w- was back in an upswing in 99, not certainly not to where it was, you know. Back hit back at the at the height, no, and I mean, like you said, million million sellers in months, and now you know it's a triumph if there's a hundred thousand sellers. Yeah, a hundred thousand is an amazing number. Roy Thomas said he made the most royalties of any time in his entire career from Secret Defenders number one. Uh, <laughs> there's stories of Marvel sending um, Chris Claremont and John Romita Jr. an all expense paid trip to Paris at one point. Um, there are stories of the image founders who all created their own studios, giving gifts to their, to their employees that first year of sports cars for free because they were doing so well. I mean, these stories go on and on of just this, this incredible flood of money in the industry. And then it all just collapsed, like kind of overnight in a way, um, with stuff like the death of Superman, the return of Superman, selling way below people's expectations, and um, you know the, the four di- four different Supermans who return, and they expected to grab people's attention, but instead those books bombed. Um, and really? of course, the rain, the, the, those Reign of the Superman books bombed. Well, they went down, down, down. But there was a tremendous interest right at the very beginning of, with Superman Returns. Then they they kind of dragged the, those stories out for several months, and those books had steadily crushing uh, sales, like drops of like twenty five percent per month. Wow, because I because I I was hanging on every issue of that story. The one that I avoided and had no interest in was the Clone Wars. Of course. Oh my god! And that's and that was classic the, the, failure story. Please, yeah, go on. Oh, John, that was the most painful part of writing the whole <laughs> book was having to reread that stuff. God. <laughs> Um, because that just went on on. man. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And even they say that part of it was, you know, because of Marvel themselves going, no, we got to keep it going. Yeah. And even, and even the writers in ours are like, I don't know if that's a good idea. And truly like some really good friends of mine in the industry, guys like Alex Saviak were like, you know, some of the main artists and writers on that stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it, that's, that's the, don't worry. We don't, we don't have to talk about that. (laughs) (laughs) But no, I mean, it, yeah, it, it combines a whole bunch of different threads. So there's the internal Marvel politics, which was basically, we don't want to stop the Clone War because we're doing this Heroes Reborn thing and it'll take people's attention away from Heroes Reborn. Um, we don't want to, we want to keep this going because it seems to be generating sales. And actually, at the very beginning of that storyline, it actually spurred some sales at, at, on the Spider-Man book. For the first three or four months, when it seemed like it was going to lead to something, the sales actually went up. And then I think it was when basically Marvel decided that Peter Parker was the clone and not Ben Riley yeah. that people started getting legitimately angry at this yes, at, at yes. the storyline. Um, and then sales started dropping like a stone, and there was all this <laughs> fury about it. And oh, those books 
are the biggest exercise in just treading water you can ever imagine. And that storyline was meant to be over in like three or four months, ended up lasting two years. Two um, years? You oh, can, my God. You can, you can see the passion, though, in that final issue of, that, of the story. Uh, I think it's Peter Parker, Spider-Man 75. The the art by John Romita Jr. just has so much passion in because you can tell he's just sick of this damn thing. And he just wants everyone, everything in it to be over, done with, characters to be dead, <laughs> things to move on. And finally he gets to draw it. Um, and like you can practically read the, it's like this giant sigh of relief. Like, thank God I am done with this stuff now. <laughs> so – I, I, are you are you able to pinpoint like what uh, after the dust cleared and they had to kind of I mean there's a lot of downsizing going on obviously it, but did they reduce uh, their their uh, amount of, and I, I have to focus on the big two I know a lot of companies obviously came and went in the 90s mm-hmm. and that's all chronicled but for DC and Marvel did they did they ever have to cut back on titles and did they you know did they do things to kind of cut back because of the drop. Yeah, well, um, yeah, it's interesting because during the the peak of the boom, Marvel especially was publishing like 120 titles a month. It's just insanity. Um, By the time – and Marvel has this whole other side story that we touch on also um, around their bankruptcy and around basically the investors at the time were grifters who were just trying to steal as much money out of Marvel as they possibly could. Oh, yeah. Do you know the the book – there's that great financial book that covers correlation – Comic Wars by Dan Raviv, yes. Yes, it's indeed. A fascinating book. Yeah, fascinating really. Book. Boy, there's your inside baseball of what happened and everything. And yeah, Carl Eichen and um, Ron Perlman. And mm-hmm. yeah, like you said, these robber barons that really came in and just gutted Marvel. They didn't care at all about comics. I mean, Perlman especially just prided himself on, on having never read a comic, but yet they own this business where they had this conception that they are worth something, but really all they wanted to do was a business they could can continually add more companies to. So they bought trading kind of companies and sticker companies and other tangential businesses and just stuck them on the bottom line as a way of just continually growing market share. And even like, uh, so you may remember, which was published by uh, Malibu Comics in 93, say, 94. Say again, man. Every, every now and then you're dropping out. I'm not sure why. Oh, I'm sorry. I might That's be leaning back from be... my phone as well. Oh, okay. So I'll try to keep myself over the phone. I get excited talking about this stuff, as you can hear. <laughs> so um, uh, in 1993, a company called uh, Malibu Comics, mm-hmm. which was flush with money because they had uh, they were the original co-publisher of Image Comics. And they were able to make like 10% a book off of the uh, wholesale oh price. Oh, my God. Well, yeah, that so, helps. So they had this amazing windfall and then created their own comic line called Ultraverse. Um, Ultraverse had a characters like Prime, Mantra, um, prototype and others who you probably don't remember well you might remember but uh also classic quarter bin fodder um <laughs> long story short um at, at one point uh they decided they were going to try and sell their company dc was courting them for a long time and they were doing some um very systematic business arrangements with with dc marvel catches wind of this potential sale and swoops in at the last moment outbids DC for the books and pays way more than they should be paying uh, without getting too deep in the weeds. They paid way more than, than the uh, actual business value of the, of the titles published that uh, they buy the company. And then basically they bury the company. They, never, they publish a handful of comics that do poorly. And they say, well, in this case we can't keep publishing them and they kill the lines. They've invested millions of dollars in buying this company that they never do anything with. And the whole reason was to keep them away from DC because they were afraid if DC had bought uh, Malibu and Ultraverse, they would pick up market share. And that's all that Marvel cared about. They didn't care about money. They just cared about market share, keeping so, the largest portion of the market share. That's just crazy, man. And it's, yeah, it shows you the pettiness of, of the time and everything. So just amazing. <sighs> yeah. So this book isn't just all about business either. It's fun to talk about the, the back end side of this. And I, I have a friend who teases me all the time. You care more about like what happened in com- about comics than you do about comics themselves. But it's also fun to celebrate the ac- the actual work, you know. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Whether whether it's rediscovering something like uh, Neil Gaiman's Stardust or the Amalgam comics or the yes. earliest Deadpool comics or um, e- even e- like uh, uh, the uh, oh, maximum clonage of Spider Man. Um, <laughs> no, all I this hear you, stuff. Man. 
Yeah, uh, no, you're yeah, right. And, and... Fun, right. And I was never really a big fan of stuff like uh, the Onslaught saga. But now getting to read it again and having to kind of take a journalistic approach to it, it's like this really is a lot of fun in those books. And so to me, it's been a great exercise also in just like having a reason to do kind of quarter bin diving and getting to rediscover a lot of fun <laughs> stuff. And so a lot of what we try and do in this book is just bring out some of the fun in it that we had reading the, these books, um, whether it's like the nth, uh, like the Valiant Comics reboot of 1998, which is just didn't sell at all. sold maybe 10,000 copies per issue, but it's just really fun. They did a, a different take on it. So man of war, that's very cool. Um, or whatever it may be. It's just fun to, to dig into this stuff and kind of discover a lot of old favorites. I mean, we have, well over 200 different I- illustrations in the book from some of the works that were published during the time um, that uh, I think illustrates some of the some of the key high levels, the uh, key points of the decade. And it's just it, it, I think anyone reading this who even has a little interest in these books uh, will have a great time reading the, the uh, American Comic Chronicles. Well, and I also think that uh, people in their um, 40s and, and in their 30s. That was their decade, I'm guessing. Yeah. And I'm probably screwing up my math right now. But I do know that people younger than me uh, that are creators and stuff, you know, Scotty Young is my fa- – Scotty Young and, and Robert Kirkman, you know, will be mm-hmm. happy to tell you how much they love 90s comics. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I understand because they were kids when that stuff was coming out. And, yeah, man, the stuff that was coming out in your tween years, that's like – yeah, that's your favorite decade. I mean, I love a ton of 70s – DC and Marvel that probably in rereads don't hold up. But again, it was, you know, all new and exciting to me. So every comic book death or uh, Justice League and, and just and Justice Society team up. These were yep. major events and they were very yep. exciting. So I get it. And I and yeah, so this is kind of like the perfect kind of volume to remember and also, yeah, r- remind you of books that. You know, kind of came and went, but that's the great thing. You really co- chronicle the history of not only the big sellers, but the gems, like you said, that, you know, didn't make it. And then, you know, we're, we're a fun run, but like I said, we're cut short for whatever reasons. So, yeah, it's an interesting time, and it's, it's really good stuff. It's great to rediscover stuff like Defiant Comics and um, Warriors of Plasm, those books that they put out, the early uh, Valiant – or not Valiant uh, – Valiant's wonderful, too, but the early Vertigo books – um, getting to rediscover Sandman Mystery Theater from that era, for Loved example, Sandman Mystery is just Theater. a yes. treat, right? Um, the their milestone comics, which are now yes. pretty much forgotten, but um, there's just wonderful stuff that came out during from that too. And I think uh, you know it's interesting because like uh, Milestone, for example, debuted 25 years ago, 26 years ago in February, and I think the people who would especially love a book like this as a Christmas gift are the people who are now hitting their mid to late thirties. And this stuff will just kind of resonate with you. It's just, but I think anyone who loves comics history will enjoy it too. I mean, um, I wrote the seventies book, as I mentioned, and I, we're, we're rough contemporaries. So okay. getting to write about that was um, just a lot of fun too, because it was, it was great to bring back these old memories. And I was able to write a history that kind of showed my love for particular creators and times and works. hundred um, percent, man. Yeah. But it was also really fun to be a little more objective and put together this interesting narrative story that pulls together the 90s in a way that I think has never been produced before. There's never been a book like this that kind of takes that decade, puts everything together and gives you the larger context around what was happening, what some of the cool stuff is that that you might be interested in reading, both from a mainstream standpoint and from an alternative standpoint. I agree. And um, yeah, get into on. some of the back end stuff too. So I didn't mean to make, turn this into an infomercial, but. Um... No, no, man, it's okay. Hey, honestly, <laughs> one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you truly is because I tried during uh, December to point out books and say, hey, this is a good idea if you're looking for a good Christmas gift. So I am happy to include uh, <laughs> uh, the 90s Chronicle as as one of those books. No, honestly, I, I truly do. So, uh, no, go ahead. Go for the infomercial, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I think I've done enough. Uh, but, yeah, any decade that gives us, like, the er, the first issues of Hellboy can't be a bad decade. Your Hellboy, Sandman, like you said, Preacher, uh, Vertigo in general – no, it yep. was it definitely got big numbers, and uh, you 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 know give big numbers a shout out. Uh, a great collaboration mm-hmm. between Alan Moore and Bill Sienkiewicz that never finished. Um, are, yeah. is, is Moore's um, those image books that he did that were they were kind of a parody of uh, Marvel? Uh, yeah, 
America's Greatest Comics or even 1963? Yes. Uh, 1963 was what I was yeah. thinking of. Yeah, those are so fun too. Yeah. In uh, the book? It covered in the book? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Very and in cool. fact, though he – so more specifically put together those books for two reasons. One is he just wanted to have fun and write something that was really kind of not – deep uh and yeah. thoughtful yeah. the other is he knew he was going to make so much money from him that he wanted to bring in some of his favorite independent comics creators and have him have a nice windfall yes so, rick veach so, was uh, in there yeah who else give us some exactly minutes. steve Bissett, john tottleman yes. uh uh um oh my god now i'm spacing on his name the guy who did yummy for chester brown they were oh, chester all brown, sure. yeah, and yeah, all yeah. made and I all made like more money than they really ever made in their entire career <laughs> from this kind of six issue pastiche of Marvel Comics with Mystery Incorporated, The Fury, Tales from Beyond, Tales of the Akani, Horus, Lord of Light, and the Tomorrow Syndicate. Like, okay, it's some one shot characters, but like there's so much passion and energy and fun in those books that um, they sold like crazy. Well, and as you say, a precursor to what was to come later because he would put in. Uh, the equivalent of like Stan's soapbox, and he was Al, affable Al. I remember as uh, affable, affable Al, Al, exactly affable Al Moore. And it's like, yeah, that's great, man. And then you know, the plan was to do uh, a kind of dystopian final issue that never actually saw the light of day. And I know Rick Veach has written in detail about you know what it was supposed to be and his view of why everything collapsed. And it's it's a shame because that was a fun. Like you said, throwaway thing, and a lot of the ideas that he did, as far as uh, back matter, as, as as the phrase has been coined since, uh, you know, wound up in like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, right? Which also came out in 1999. So that's part of the kind of a sudden uh, boom that we saw in '99 was League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Tom Strong, Top Ten, all those yes. books that uh, more put out through uh, American's Greatest Comics um, that were like these unexpectedly just fun books. That were, uh, Promethea is, of course, the, the one that's most critically acclaimed. But um, yeah, all that whole line was kind of birthed in this whole 1963 concept where he just kind of was rediscovering his deep passion for his childhood loves. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I, I, I love uh, this. I love this line too that Moore talks about. He imagined that line as a quote alternative future for the comics industry. He wanted them to be a certain type of heroism that comics had moved away from during the nineties, um, and bring back like pure heroes, as well as this kind of imaginative concepts he brought in for Promethea. And so, like you could see, the, one of the things we like to do in the book is also tell this arc of these creators and the work they produce, and you could really see this arc of like. More started with 1963 and being obviously dissatisfied with the nature of comics at that time. And by 99, he kind of worked through those issues, put out that wonderful work he did on Supreme uh, yes. in 98 and 97, and then worked it through to, to these uh, to books like Tom Strong and Top Ten by 99. That really became this kind of fulfillment of the whole ethos he was trying to push. Agreed. No, I love that stuff. And uh, friends with some of his collaborators like Gene Ha and Top Ten and uh, – Splash Brannigan uh, was uh, Hillary Barta, and it was kind of a, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a Plastic Man homage in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah, no, those are terrific books. I have Jack B. Quick uh, with Kevin Nolan. And, Kevin Nolan, know, that amazing artwork, yeah. Beautiful stuff, absolutely, man. And great ideas, really, really great concepts. No, I, uh, like you said, man, uh, the, there's a lot of gold in the 90s, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of crap as well. But, <laughs> <laughs> but again, that's what makes... Uh, the comic book chronicles so much fun, uh, and I and I really every decade again. If you're if you're interested in any of these decades, and like I said, I'm going to have to go back and uh, check out your work on the 70s and and on the 80s as well. Um, I'm I'm as particularly interested in uh, you know the DC implosion. I know I bought a book about the DC implosion. I haven't really got through it yet. But, Actually, my uh, my editor Keith Dallas also worked on the uh, DC implosion book. There and his go. collaborator wrote the 1960s volumes for the American Comic Chronicles. Oh, that's cool. Excellent. So it's man. all within the family. <laughs> no, honestly, and, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a huge Tomorrow's fan, man. I, I truly uh, – I always buy Alter Ego and um, and uh, Back Issue in particular. And uh, I eventually will have Michael Urey on to talk about Back Issue. I've talked to Roy about, uh, about Alter Ego. And, yeah, Roy's uh, the best too. Just oh, love yeah. that guy. You know what it's, happened? Why did Amazing Heroes? Because I know it ended in the '90s. Why did Why did Fantagraphic stop doing Amazing Heroes? So my first job in the industry was actually at Amazing Heroes. Oh no, kidding! Uh, I worked at, I worked for them for about three years or so, 
Um, and if you look at any of the last 30 or so issues, you'll see freelance work I did for them. Um, it was simple, actually. The sales were just declining. The wizard okay. was eating our lunch by the, by the time Amazing wow. Heroes uh, got canceled. And um, there's just the price guide combined with the flashiness of the art and the slickness of the paper um, was just something Fantagraphics couldn't compete with. Sure, sure. So it's just it that simple. Rag. Yeah, I understand. Boy, that's a shame because I'll tell you, I was – of all the great uh, comic magazines, Comics Interview and, uh, you know, of course, you know, Wizard and, and the like, uh, Amazing Heroes was always my favorite. And it's funny, I even remember uh, finding and uh, taking a picture with my camera and sending to, to Bendis. Uh, when he was a kid, he did a Superboy illustration mm -hmm. that wound up in one mm -hmm. of the issues. And, uh, and yeah, and it's like, oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> 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 that might have been in one of my issues, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, if, you know, the interview, if you remember the interview with Dave Sim that ran, I think, number 201, that was my interview. Oh, that's great, man. No, and I, I mean, I've talked to Mark Wade about his work in Amazing Heroes. And didn't Busick used to do um, essays as well? Yeah, he did some work for, uh, I believe, before my time on that project okay yeah okay no it was no and i mean i started reading it in the 80s well and again that's why the 90s is really an interesting time and you point that out as well that it was coming off of the black and white boom of the 80s and you know th that's that's i'm assuming it was the 80s that the direct market really took off i know it predated the 80s and in certain cities and we had we had you know specialty stores in in chicago and stuff but it really seemed like the 80s was the decade where and in fact, I think you even say that in the introduction of the book, that that's when the publishing focus went away from the newsstand and really focused yeah. into the, the specialty stores. And the yeah, we talk about that a lot in the 1970s book, actually, because that all started in 1978 and 79. Okay. Um, spurred by Jim Shooter talking to Chuck Rosansky, who sued um, what that time was Seagate Distribution for having exclusive distribution rights in America, which is a little ironic how, considering how the story played out. Um, and that created the birth of the direct market um, for two reasons. One is that we suddenly got uh, many more distributors scattered all around the country. And then many of those distributors started their own comic book companies. So Pacific Comics from the early 1980s yes. came from Pacific Comics Distribution. Capital yes. Comics, who first published Nexus and Badger, came from Capital City Distribution. Um, Malibu, who I just mentioned, came from Sunrise Distribution. And so that was this kind of natural synergy where they would – that this all evolved out of it. So really because of because the the market opened up in the late 1970s, then we had the boom in the early 1980s, and then an even bigger boom in 1986-87 around the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, which was this massive boom yes. and bust cycle that happened very quickly where like the, because <laughs> the Turtles were just this overwhelming success, uh, which is a great story just by itself. There's a book just in the rise and fall of, of – uh, uh, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird and the Turtles. Yes. Um, the, that mar the market boomed and then busted. And then Batman, the first Batman movie came out. Um, and that then triggered another boom in the industry. Uh, and then just as that was kind of starting to peter out, that's when the comics industry started really growing. Um, and in fact, like basically it's in the shadow of the Batman movie um, that Spider-Man number one comes out uh, by McFarlane. Because McFarlane was feeding off the fan enthusiasm from the people who had moved into comics because they loved the Batman movies so much. So it all kind of feeds on itself because then that spurs the rise of image with incredible boom in the industry. And all of a sudden, like, although the entire cycle just kind of flows through itself again. So it's interesting how if you th see the longer view, it's basically boom, bust, boom, bust. Sure. And the long bust, it's all tied together. It is interesting, too, that, as you say, because of the success of the 89 Batman movie, it did bring people to the comic stores. And I know that's the classic frustration right now with all yeah. the success of the movies and the television. And it's like, how come they're not coming to the stores? Now, mm -hmm. obviously, if they are for Walking Dead. You know, Walking Dead certainly translated into more sales for Robert and everything. So in that case, it worked. But it is interesting that, uh, you know, we haven't had that uh, – you know the, the the wave coming back to the shore after right. you know after you know the big success of the movies and TV. Yeah, that's the most 
most interesting thing to me is that like that ne- we never had the spur in sales after that first Batman movie. There's just something special about that movie for some reason, maybe in the hype that uh, captured people's attention. Marvel came out with the – or not Marvel, but uh, when the Blade movie came out in uh, 98, I believe. Yes. Um, and it was a – runaway hit i mean yes. people forget how revolutionary that was it was a completely unexpected hit too and marvel really isn't even really ready to uh sell blade comics they didn't do any effort that's right to uh cross over and, and build sales based on it yeah 98 was a, a, a no. big hit oh absolutely um, and and in fact i because people always credit 99 for the spider-man and x-men movies and it's like no mm-hmm. no no it started with blade and, was was it. and also yep. the same missed opportunity in 99 with X-Men. I remember they had the, the, the opportunity to, to put in comic pages in TV Guide. And they, you know, they had it in you know, whatever mid-story that was completely uh, impenetrable for somebody just walking in and going, oh, I like the X-Men movie. Maybe I would like the comic. And it was you know, like this middle <laughs> yeah. story scene that did nothing in terms of helping them promote. And it's like, oh, you idiots. What a classic opportunity when TV Guide still mattered and was such a high-selling magazine right. to possibly get people interested. And, well, that's why those uh, those brilliant people that failed with Blade and, and uh, X-Men were on the way out and made room for, for Casada and Jimmy Palmiotti with Marvel Knights and Jemis and the new regime of Marvel in the 2000s. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the entire industry turned over basically because of Marvel Knights. And, you know, Marvel Knights was just an experiment, too. I mean, uh, during that time, so at, Marvel did uh, Heroes Reborn, which was basically giving uh, the, their main characters to the image creators. And they reached out to all the image creators, yes. and only um, only Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld took on the characters. Um, after that, they reached out to other companies as well. Chaos Comics put out a five-issue Halloween-based miniseries as kind of a pilot for them to do a line of comics for Marvel. Uh, Marvel actually had a contract in hand with a Filipino company that was going to put out a line of like 30 comics in 1998-99 that fell through. And Marvel Knights was just another attempt to kind of grab at that kind of cherry, which was you know just to have – work kind of farmed out to other creators and that just happened to be the one that caught people's attention and, and really was well hyped and a lot of it was kevin smith on daredevil uh which to people outside the industry was like oh my god kevin smith's doing comics yep. uh, how, how is this a thing and then ah. and, and then they got hooked into the line and hooked into the the cool stuff that's happening in comics at the time yeah it was great stuff marvel knights absolutely and i've had conversations with casada and palmiati about that Amazing line in the people they gathered and finally got to talk to Christopher Priest about it, too, uh, just a few months ago. So, oh, that uh, Black Panther run is so good. Absolutely, man. No, no. And they really had to, like, kind of shake fans and say, look, this is I mean, I remember the ads and it was like, hey, Black Panther's really, really good right now. You should uh-huh. be reading it. And thankfully, it holds up because I think a lot of uh, now with the success of the movie, uh, they've been putting the trades out again and everything, and it's like, yeah, that stuff. You know, I mean, it's it's a little different than today's comics, but I think it's readable enough. And it seems to me that I've I've met enough people that have read it for the first time and like, oh, this is really good. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they would have had the Black Panther movie without those trades, without those comics. I agree with you. No, absolutely, man. Uh, it's well, and again, it, it's going to be. Is there are there plans at tomorrow's to do the first decade of the two thousands? Yeah, that's come up a few times in interviews. If there is, uh, I'm not going to be writing it. Writing the 90s book was a lot of work. Uh, it took me I almost bet. four years to write this thing. Wow. Uh, it's 180,000 words. Two <laughs> run- I actually did three th- – I have almost 3,000 scans we prepped for the book. So, yeah, it was it was a lot of stuff. But I want to just move on to other things in my life. Uh, I know the I next understand. volume that's coming out <laughs> is uh, the early ni- – the first half of the 1940s. So we're going to do a two-volume set on the 40s and okay. that, that'll complete the entire history from 1940 to 1999 that's fantastic uh, and it makes sense to do two volumes for the 40s because there really was the war years and then the post-war years so i can appreciate that yeah it's a fascinating era too of course uh <laughs> about as different from the 90s as you could possibly get oh absolutely uh, God. but uh kurt mitchell who's done a number of books on comic history as well as uh writing for Alter Ego is working on that book. I was actually – I had lunch with him not too long ago, and he's very excited about it and very deep into the research on it. Um, it's fascinating actually to hear how hard it is for him to find his source material. For me, it's a lot of quarter bin diving. Uh, for him, it's a lot of hard research. 
Did you reach out to creators or publishers as well and, and get interviews with them? So that's an interesting part of this because that's a, that's a rule I made for myself at the beginning was to do as few new interviews as possible. Interesting. Why? Because people's memories get distorted over time. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So if you hear any of the interviews with like the original image founders, they talk about it basically predestined that they would be a success. But there's so <laughs> much there's so much press from the era, sure. from the time that shows like what people were actually thinking that like it's much more interesting to say, well, we're going to take the to re- read interviews and say we're going to take this chance. What's the worst that will happen? We'll go back to Marvel. Well, they would never admit that they said that, but right. it's in an issue of Hero <laughs> Illustrated or whatever. And and. You know, you're never going to get that freshness. Um, there's I hear this, you, man. Go there's on. this awesome interview with Rob Liefeld from eighty from ninety seven, where he's talking. You know, basically, Image came together in ninety two, and then by ninety seven, they were all fighting each other. Yes. They're trying to kick Rob out, and yes. then uh, Mark Silvestri left for a while, and there was all this kind of big battling and stuff. And there's this great interview with with Liefeld in an issue of. Amazing Heroes by Hart, or not Amazing Heroes, Comics Journal by Hart Fisher, who is also a kind of an interesting character in comics history. Um, and Fisher has Liefeld basically saying, yeah, I know I screwed this up. I made a lot of mistakes in my life, and I just have to live with it. That's like, you're never going to find him saying that now. But at the time, this is where his mindset was. I and so um, yeah. it's just very fun to kind of dig into that, that whole side of thing and really see what people's thoughts were. So we did some yeah. modern interviews. I interviewed, for example, the one of the co-creators of uh, Malibu Comics, and that's where I got the inside story about um, the Marvel deal. Um, I actually talked to Jim Shooter about his time in the in the decade, um, partially for this book, partially for another book I, I have out called Jim Shooter Conversations. It's through University Press in Mississippi. Um, and he gave a lot of interesting uh, inside scoop on the three, the four different companies he worked on in the 90s. Um, Valiant well, to Broadway, out, yeah. yeah, Defiant Valiant Broadway. Uh, go on, Valiant Broadway. Actually, there's three: Valiant, Defiant, and Broadway. Oh, Defiant was right. That was the third one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and crazy stories about that. How they released the first issues of Plaza as a trading card set um, because of, for because of the trading a trading card company had invested in their company, and so they had to produce the first set of the first issue as a trading card set, and they so they had these binders to collect the co- collect the trading cards but the binders uh, production was late so they invested a million dollars in producing these cards and they sold barely anything and then the whole company was sabotaged by marvel we get into this in very deep detail in the book and it's also fascinating just how how like small and nasty the industry was at the time understood and no there you know that's great because i know i read uh the howard chicken conversations book from mm-hmm. a few years ago so that's great, man. Oh, I have to. Oh, I have to pick up your, your other book. That's excellent. Uh, yeah, I would thanks. love to read that. No, absolutely. And Shooter is one of those guys I haven't had the opportunity yet to talk to. So uh, I'm gonna have to make that happen uh, sooner than later. He was you know, what, fascinating. He was I have fascinating. No doubt. Oh my god, a guy that's been in the business since he was 13 years old. Good lord. Yeah, if not he was, 12. <laughs> you know, whenever he started writing those Legion was, comics when he was yeah, a little he, kid, he was 15. And yeah, well, I thought uh, he was younger than even 15. But you're probably right. No, I don't know. It, it was um, it was just dumb luck that he got the job too, because like he wrote a letter to Mort Weisinger saying, "I can do better than these stupid Legion of Superhero comics," <laughs> and like Weisinger, who was like this famous uh, like Psycho ogre, yes. psychopath is a great <laughs> word for it, dude. Seriously, um, I've talked Shooter, to people who've worked for him. I understand. Go on. Shooter tells the story over and over again. He's fifteen years old at that at this point, sixteen when he really started writing for him. And um, at that time, the Batman TV show was on twice a week, uh, and <laughs> Weisinger would call Shooter every Thursday after the end of the second Batman episode. That <laughs> right, week. the the finish to the cliffhanger. Yeah, yeah. And and Shooter would pick up the phone, and his hands would be trembling, and he'd be sitting in his parents' kitchen. And mind you, his dad had trouble finding work at that time, and so the family was depending on his income to pay the freaking mortgage. Yeah, in Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, in, Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh, right? Yeah, because his dad was a steel worker who got caught in a bunch of labor disputes and had just wow. trouble keeping a job. Uh, so Shooter's getting these calls, and and um, Weisinger's berating him: "You are the worst. You're a terrible writer. You you can't write comic books. I can't believe you're so terrible." And then uh, and so Shooter says, "Like for years, I had a pathological fear of talking on the telephone." Wow. 
At the same time, Weisinger is going to his uh, his fellow editors and saying, you won't believe how good my kid is. This kid is amazing. He's the best writer I have in my stable. Um, but it's just his way of like uh, just uh, abusing Shooter, um, oh, yeah. which explains so much about how he approaches the world and and his whole attitude towards his, his creative work. Um, so, yeah, I, that was just a fascinating book. Um, well, I bet, man. No, that's that's interesting. And, yeah, you're right. Uh, good Lord. The guy the guy's a teenager and he's writing The Death of Feral Lad, which is, you know, one of the classic <laughs> Silver Age legion stories things like absolutely that. I, absolutely I, yeah. I read all that stuff in reprints you know in 80 page giants and 100 page spectaculars and uh-huh. yeah they were great stories they're wonderful stories and yeah it's no like you said i mean he really made an impact with valiant and you know and, and also marvel i mean you know i i know just as many uh, creators that didn't like working with jim that did you know there's about half and half um, I know Gene Colan was never a fan of Gene. So they <laughs> no, he had that wasn't. conversation before Dear Gene passed away. So no, know. he wasn't. No, they, they, there was a lot of hatred there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Shooter's definitely the most controversial character that I ever written about. Uh, he, of course, is the hero of his own story, and uh, no one okay. will ever tell him otherwise. I guess we all are. Um, yeah, and also, hey, man, it's there. There are people that are these Type A personalities, but then they have the talent to back it up. Yeah, and it's like, well, you know, I'm I'm a great writer and I'm a great editor, and it's like, well, given your body of work, yeah, you are. So yeah, it's I mean, hard to it's hard to disagree with that, you know. There was high quality in all the comics he put out in the '90s. I'll tell you that much. Uh, the early Image books, and he wore, there's a great story where he worked something like 500 days in a row. What not really uh, working for Valiant? He worked 500 days in a row at Valiant. He worked Christmas. He worked New Year's. He worked every single day. He tells a story where he was never able to get a haircut because he was so busy working on the damn comics. <laughs> he paid so much attention to the detail. He tells this cute little anecdote of he once had a guy call him up in the evening on Christmas night. Um, saying, hey, I need to talk to you about this project. Sorry for calling you on Christmas. And Shooter's like, come on down to the office. I'm still here. <laughs> like, wow, there's devotion. Wow. Um, and then uh, one of the most interesting stories in the book is uh, why he left Image, or why he left Valiant. I don't know why I keep making that same mistake. Sorry, no listeners. Because uh, <laughs> I literally heard five different stories about why he left Valiant Comics. Uh, Shooter tells a story – as Shooter tells a story, his co- his business partner was named Steve Masarski, who is the talent agent for, among others, the Doobie Brothers and Cindy Lauper, the test of your age. Anyone under the age of 20 <laughs> or age of 35 won't have any idea who I'm talking about. Um, uh, and, and as Shooter tells a story, Masarski was having an affair with the accountant at the company, and they conspired to push him out. Um, as other people tell it, Shooter was asking for an outrageous percentage of, of the value of the characters and some IP against them, and they pushed him out because uh, he was being completely unreasonable. And all we can do in the book, because we have these completely unreconcilable differences, is just to like list all these different stories. And frankly, it's a lot of fun to list all these different stories because then we'll leave it to you to decide. Very I don't cool. know what to believe. I just think it's interesting. Absolutely, man. No, no, no. I, I hear what you're saying, and uh, it sounds like you get the same kind of fascination and joy out of interviewing and putting together your books in the same way that I tried to with Word Balloon. And, and like you said, and I'm glad, uh, it makes sense in terms of researching this book, and you'll get more candid interview or at least candid point of views about what the people were thinking at the time. And that's what I love so much about Amazing Heroes and Wizard at mm-hmm. its best and all these other magazines that Comics Interview, David Kraft's uh, book, wasn't it? David Anthony Kraft? Or, yeah, Comics yep. Interview, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, and truly that's what I try to do with Word Balloon is if you want to know what Jeff John was thinking, Jeff John's when they were making 52, listen to this episode of Word Balloon and he's talking about it. And, yeah, I mean, that's that's the great thing. And I, and I know that uh, a handful of the creators have told me that's why they appreciate uh, what I try to do because yeah you know yeah I just want that platform and also I'm a lazy writer I wrote I wrote, <laughs> I wrote for boxing magazines and sports magazines in the late eighties and through the mid nineties and I, I am the living embodiment of uh, was it Dorothy Parker that said I hate writing but love having written yes uh, and you know oh my and, God. and and again I I hear the the relief of uh, this book being finished after your four years of labor. <laughs> I, believe me, man. I understand. It is it is tough to commit to write for myself, 
and so I can appreciate the feeling of, all right, it's done. Now can I go on to something else? But it's uh, I'm glad you're out there, man, because uh, I know you're doing great work. And uh, you know, and forgive me, is is Comics Bulletin <laughs> still around, or is is it no longer? I left the site about two and a half years ago, so I still do a little bit of freelancing for them. But I'm okay. mostly mostly concentrating on books. So Good I have you, um, three other books in different stages of production. Um, two more for the uh, conversation series for University Press of Mississippi. Um, one on Steve Gerber that's going to come out in late 2019. Wow. And the second on uh, Don McGregor. Speaking of Black Panther. Oh, that's great, man. Oh, Jesus. And I, you know, when I got to talk to Priest, I did a Black Panther panel at uh, Terrificon in Connecticut in August. And oh, cool. That's where, you know, so it was, that was my, you know, finally, I've been trying to get Don for years. And, um, but that Don was. Don is a treat. Don. Don is oh, such a character. Hilarious. Yeah. And, 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 yeah, yeah. And the same with Chris. I mean, Priest is, Priest is amazing. And yeah, I mean, I just have such respect for those guys. So no, that's great. Hey, when, when I, when all those books are ready, you're certainly welcome back because. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, man. No, I, like I said, I love the Chaken book. I don't know who wrote it for them. If, you know. Oh, that, gosh, I don't know. But that was a terrific book that they put out as well. And no, I, I, it's, it's like Citizen Kane. You know the reference. But yeah, I mean, you get all these different, just like you were saying about uh, the deal with, you know, how things fell out with uh, Shooter and everything. No, you, you, it's, it's interesting assembling all the different points of view from a certain incident. And, and yeah, I mm-hmm. mean, you know, again, it's up to the reader to decide where the truth is and all of the different variances of, of everyone's point of view and how things hashed out. So, and man, Gerber's a fascinating guy. And McGregor's a fascinating guy. So those are the two. And what's the third one? Did you say the third one? Uh, and then, oh, I, it's probably a little premature for me to talk about, it, but I'm, ta- I'm thinking of doing um, some oral histories as well. Terrific! That's great, man. Hey, yeah. Well, again, that's like I said. It's uh, as opposed to writing. That's what that's what I do here at Word Balloon. Yeah. And I'm all for more. The great thing is, man. I don't like. The, believe me, not a competitive bone in my body. I want more <laughs> good podcasts where people are having good comic book conversations and well, Dave Harper is a guy who out in Alaska is doing off panel and he's doing okay. great uh, he's doing great one-on-one interviews with comic creators so uh, no we need more so please da- please Jason come <laughs> join us in the pool it's okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah it'll be called classic comics cavalcade um, it's probably I have a five uh, podcasts in in the can already and I want to get Terrific. about 10 built up first um, uh, I'll be running some classic interviews as well as some new interviews and um, narrative type work as well as uh, just whatever kind of sparks my, my imagination because the whole idea is to just kind of share my love for comics. I feel like we've lived parallel lives, John. Absolutely, man. No, this has been a great uh, pleasure getting to meet you. And, and uh, yeah, we're, we're running in the same milieu. And I uh, and like I said, I uh, that's great because – um, well, again, I'm sure we have our own little different idiosyncratic ways of uh, and our own. Well, and it's just our own curiosities, yes. our own personal curiosities. Yes, and for so, sure. like I said, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. It's okay. It's like, no, a bunch of us can talk to Howard Chaik, and a bunch of us can talk to, you know, Don McGregor, or, or you know, name any creator, Denny O'Neill. I've, I've been bothering him for uh, for an entire year this past year, and uh, he's been very gracious coming back uh, a couple times. So no, it's great, man, and and truly, uh, yeah. When you're ready with that project and the books, you're always welcome back. But uh, for our purposes today, it's uh, I want to get the title right. I've got it here: American Comic Book Chronicles, the '90s. It's published by Two Morrows, and uh, Jason Sachs is your author. So uh, good, good job, man. Excellent book. Again, definitely on the Christmas list for people. You should definitely check it out. And uh, great conversation. Happy to have you back. Thank you. That's Jason Sachs, the author of American Comic Book Chronicles, the 90s. Check it out. It's available at Tomorrow's, and you can order it uh, through your local comic shop as well. But it is an excellent collection. You can also get a digital version of the book as well at the Tomorrow's website. So uh, consider that. These these histories are really amazing and uh, very in-depth. And, uh, and i got to tell you, I, I was very impressed with the book and my conversation with Jason. I hope you enjoyed today's Word Balloon. It was brought to you again by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Truly, League, thank you very much for the continued support via Patreon. If you want to subscribe to Word Balloon, do you think Word Balloon is worth uh, the price of a comic book a month? Is it worth a dollar a month? If you think so and you like what I do here, you can go to patreon.com slash wordballoon or go to the Patreon ad right on the front page of wordballoon.com. 
War Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics, the industry's fastest growing independent publishing company. They are claiming 2019 as the year of reading dangerously. Check it out. Lots of great books are coming up. Things like Stronghold with Phil Hester and Ryan Kelly. Oberon, a new supernatural series with Ryan Parrott. Dark Red from our pal Tim Seeley. Out of the Blue and Horde, just to name a few, along with great other books like A Walk Through Hell, Jimmy's Bastards, Dark Ark, Animosity, Baby Teeth, you name it. Tremendous books cutting across all genres to take readers far beyond their comfort zones. Remember, we're going to be talking to more Aftershock comic uh, creators in the weeks ahead, but you don't have to wait. You can check out full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. Thanks again for listening. Another great episode available today. Dennis Kitchen talking about the history of underground comics. And February is already jam-packed with a lot more great Word Balloon conversation. I uh, still got to get to um, my good friend, Chris Iliopoulos, who I did a great conversation with. That'll be coming up in February. Uh, also, some other old friends coming back and new people as well. So I hope you'll join me uh, for a wonderful February as we continue into 2019 here on Word Balloon. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019.